Well, good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to those of you who are present with us here in church, and a very warm welcome to, to those who are viewing our service at home. Uh, you're all very welcome, and we trust that you will experience God's presence with you, no matter where you are. Uh, just a reminder for those in church here that we do keep our masks on as much as possible and uh, we are allowed to sing but it's to sing quietly into our mask. Those of you at home can sing as loud as you like. Uh, it doesn't really matter but for those of us here quietly into our mask. So we start with some sentences of scripture. In the Psalms, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And Paul writes to the Corinthians in his second letter, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. And I thought this morning as we come to worship God that we would remind ourselves of why we are here with some words from the prayer book. Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, be with us now as we come to worship you. Help us to bring you our praises, to open our ears to your word, and to open our mind to what you have to say to us through it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now let us bring praise to God as we join in singing quietly into our masks, if you're here, uh, our opening hymn, The Splendor of the King, with an extra chorus of How Great Thou Art. Let's just stand to join together in singing that.
And now Jason will come to bring to us our children's slot. Hello, hello, hello. How are you all? You doing well? Lovely to see you all out here this morning. Um, I hope you have had a really good week and you are joining the service so far this morning. So just before I uh, bring the children's slot to you all this morning, I just want to make a wee announcement. So the Diocese of Down and Dremore have been, have been doing a competition this month for September, and it's called Butterflies of Hope. So our idea, the idea of Butterflies of Hope will be explained in this wee video here. So, Butterflies of Hope, the idea, the idea behind this competition this month is to send our hope, the hope that we have in Jesus, out to, out to the community. And we're using the symbol of a butterfly to represent that. And so, what I want the, the uh, families to do that have kids is, there's a couple of sheets at the back, a couple of butterflies, and all I want you to do is to get your kids to color in a butterfly. And what we're going to do is we're going to display it on the display board at the back, take a picture, and then I might put them around the church halls and stuff like that. And we'll have a message of hope in Jesus on each of the coloring sheets. So that's an amazing competition that we're doing. All the churches, hopefully, will be doing this competition in our diocese. And so it'd be great to chip in and to bring St. Jude's um, version of this display um, for everyone to see the hope that we have in Jesus. Um, but that's the wee initiative that the Church of Ireland have done um, for the month of September. So, for now, um, let's just carry on with the children's slot. So I have a bag, boys and girls, with me this morning, and I have in it four different items, and they all have something in common. But first, I want you to tell me what they are and what they do, okay? So we've got the first one. What is it? Who says that? Bethany? Well done. It's a toothbrush, yes. And what do you do with te your, your toothbrush, Zach? You brush your teeth, and I'm sure you do it every day, Zach, isn't that right? Yeah, I bet you do. So, you've got a toothbrush. Next thing is, what's this? Cameron? Scissors, that's right. Well done. So, what do you do with scissors? You don't cut your mommy's hair now. What do you do with scissors? You cut the paper, that's right, Cameron. So you cut paper with scissors. Next thing is, what's this here? Ooh, what's this? This is not for sale, by the way. This is just, yes, Enya. What is it, sorry? A yes, a game console controller, a, a very well done. So that's an Xbox controller. Um, you, you play games with that, that's pretty, pretty easy to find out. Do you play games with that? And the last one is this here. What's this? Yes, Stephanie? It's glue. Well done. And what do you do with glue? Yes, you, you stick, don't you? You, put, you stick some paper, don't you? So all those things are different things, aren't they? And they all have different purposes, don't they? But they all have something in common. Can anybody tell me what that is? Anybody? It's, pr it's probably not going to be that obvious, but even any of the adults, maybe? 
No, that's okay. So all of them are different, but all of them need to be held to be used. You all need to pick them up in your hands to use them. And each of them have a different purpose. And whoever made them had a plan for us to use them in a certain way. And in Kids Zone, in Kids Zone, this term, we're going to be looking at Jesus and the unfolding plan that God had by sending Jesus. And our verse today for use in Kids Zone is from Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. And it says, Jesus will save his people from their sins. Now, let's, let's, help, every, let's help the kids zone out. Let's say it once together um, so that the kids zone leaders have a bit of a platform to, to go from. So we'll say the Bible says, after three, one, two, three. The Bible says in Matthew chapter one, verse 21, Jesus will save his people from their sins. And that was God's plan. God's plan was to save his people, us sitting here today, save us from our sins. And how did he do that? Can any of the boys and girls tell me how he did that? Any smart kids? How did he do that? How did he save us from our sins? Yes. He died on the cross. Oh, yeah. He died on the cross to save us, didn't he? And that was God's plan. But just like all of these items in my bag had a plan and a purpose in mind when they were made, God made us for a purpose. God made us for a purpose, and he has a plan for each and every one of us. But just like each of these objects need to be held in your hand to use them, God, you need to, be, you need to let God hold you in his hands for him to use, use you. And so we do that by trusting and believing in Jesus and allowing him to hold us in his hands. And so that's the message this morning. And today in Kids Zone, you'll be learning a wee bit more about this unfolding plan that God had. But let's just pray to finish and then we'll continue our service. Lord, we come before you and we just give you thanks for this unfolding plan you had through Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you sent him and that Jesus came and he took the punishment for our sin. And we pray and thank you that through him we can have life and life to the full. Pray this in your name. Amen. We invite you to stand with us and sing for the children's song, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Let's stand, sing out.
We have a few notices this morning for you, and hopefully the notices are coming up behind me on the screen. Uh, the first one says, welcome, uh, and uh, you know you're all welcome. Uh, I've already expressed that at the beginning, and there is a, a September notices sheet uh, around if you want to check up on the ways we're doing things now. Each Sunday at 11 o'clock, you're here, you know that at 11 o'clock we have a service here in church and we're following Mark's gospel. If you don't have a Bible, then there are some free copies of Mark's gospel available at the back of the church. At 7 p.m. in the evenings, in the foyer of the church, we are having a service uh, which is based around some talks that were given for the Keswick Convention this year. Their the Keswick Convention was again, like everything else, was a, an online event, uh, and the uh, talks based around the theme of hope. Uh, and we're listening to those and chatting about those uh, on Sunday evenings at 7 o'clock. On Wednesday, just started a couple of weeks ago, we're having an 11 o'clock service in the morning. It's a prayer book service for those who are traditionalists. It uses the old style of the morning prayer. And you're very welcome along to that. That's Wednesday morning at 11 o'clock. Now, I think uh, if uh, Richard can get it going, we have a little video now about our uh, life groups, and I'll say something after the video is played. It's difficult for me to say how I feel about Christianity because I don't really know what it stands for anymore. That's pretty powerful to have somebody believe to start a religion based on something that you are using as a cover-up. I actually don't believe in objective suffering or objective evil. I believe the, the Bible was created by man, not uh, by God. The uh, issue for me is, does God exist? It's hard for me to answer. In fact, I think it's impossible because how do we know what truth is? Do I really think you know, Christ is going to come down and revelation is all true? Probably not. You know, if, if I guess we're on camera, but if, if I were to ask you what, what are some of the key motivators for uh, convening us and filming us, what would those be? It's actually, we're supposed to be a model for how to talk about this stuff, no matter who you are. In other words, let's just say you're a committed Christian and you have lots of friends with questions, okay? This is a model for how you have a civil discussion. For example, if somebody wants to have a, a group like this, this is the way to do it. You show, you show a clip and then you say, now let's just talk. Many cultures, and therefore many people that I meet, hold to common sense, consensus beliefs that make Christianity automatically implausible to them. And therefore, they have many genuine, heartfelt questions about why it is that so many people around the world think Christianity is true. Perhaps the best part of my work as a pastor is helping people think through issues of uh, faith and doubt, belief and skepticism. And that's exactly what we get to do in the Reason for God DVD. how I feel about Christianity because I don't really know what it stands for anymore. That's pretty powerful to have somebody believe to start a religion based on something that you... So the reason for God, uh, which follows the, the discussion series that uh, it mentioned on the video trailer, that's on Thursday nights uh, at 8 o'clock if you want to uh, access it by Zoom. 
uh, if you want to actually be present with real people, uh, it takes place on Thursday mornings at 11 o'clock in our church halls. If you do want to take part in the Zoom meeting on Thursday nights, then you will need to let us know so that we can give you details of accessing uh, the Zoom. But that's our, our Thursday, Thursday evening. Uh, life groups uh, are, are, are doing that. Uh, also coming soon is Christianity Explored. And uh, also coming soon in, in four weeks' time, to be precise, is our annual general vestry meeting. That's on Sunday, the 18th of October. There are uh, nomination papers in the foyer. If you want to nominate someone, make sure that they are in agreement to that, and then you can fill in the nomination paper in the foyer. So those, I think, are all the announcements that I have. It's time now for our little stars, our kids' zone and our youth zone to go ahead. I think the youth zone's going over to the hall. Others are in different rooms at the back. The Apostle John wrote that if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins. And so we're going to join together now using the words of the confession. So let us pray. We join together, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we continue in prayer as we bring our intercessions to God. We start with the collect or special prayer for today, the 15th Sunday after Trinity. God, who in generous mercy sent the Holy Spirit upon your church in the burning fire of your love. Grant that your people may be fervent in the fellowship of the gospel, that always abiding in you, they may be found steadfast in faith and active in service. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A prayer for hospitals and infirmaries. Almighty God, whose blessed Son went about doing good and healing all manner of sickness, continue, we pray, this his gracious work among us, especially in the hospitals and infirmaries of our land.
Grant to the physicians, surgeons, and nurses wisdom and skill, sympathy and patience, and send down thy blessing on all who labor to relieve suffering and to forward your purposes of love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A prayer for our parish. Almighty God, we ask you to bless this, our parish. Forgive us our many and grievous sins. Draw us nearer to yourself and cause true religion to increase and abound among us. Prosper the reading and preaching of your word and bless all the ministries of your church. Give patience to the sick and afflicted and make their sufferings a blessing to them. Visit with your favor the schools and all who teach or learn therein and make us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of you and of your dear Son, whom to know is life eternal. Hear us. For the sake of him who died for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And a prayer for Christian missions abroad. Almighty God, who by your Son, Jesus Christ, did give commandment to the apostles that they should go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Grant to us, whom you have called into your church, a ready will to obey your word, and fill us with a hearty desire to make your way known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Look with compassion on all who have not known you, and upon the multitudes that are scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. O Heavenly Father, Lord of the harvest, have respect we ask you to our prayers, and send forth laborers into your harvest. Fit and prepare them by your grace for the work of their ministry. Give them the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Strengthen them to endure hardness and grant that your Holy Spirit may prosper their work and that by their life and doctrine they may set forth your glory and set forward the salvation of all people. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we join together in the words that Jesus himself taught us as we say the Lord's Prayer, our Father. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now Peter will come to bring us our Bible reading. Thanks uh, to Norman for, for leading this morning. Uh, can I add my warmest welcome to his, to those here in person, and uh, to those joining us online. I invite you to turn in your Bibles now uh, to Mark chapter 10. If you haven't uh, got a Bible with you, there could be some Mark's Gospels 
in our pews or there's a service, uh, there's a sheet, just a colored piece of paper with Mark 10 on it. Mark 10, verses 17 to 31. Hear God's word from Mark 10, verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, we have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fails for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fails along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now stand for the versicles and responses, and I ask you to uh, to respond with the words in bold. O oh Lord, open our lips, and our mouth will proclaim your praise. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever, forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. And we remain standing as we affirm our faith in the God who is three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated 
as Peter brings God's word to us. friends on the back of the printed uh, sheet uh, where the Bible reading is, you'll find an outline for our, uh, for our sermon, or you can follow up on the screen behind me and turn back to that reading, Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Before we look at God's word, though, let's pause to pray. Let's ask God for help. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth, and so make us hungry for this heavenly food. May it nourish us today in ways of eternal life, through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Well, whether we'd uh, admit it or not, This year, we've all had to think about our mortality. As daily death rates were being published, we couldn't help think about this deadly virus. We've all known, haven't we, the fear of death surrounding this global pandemic. Most of us, though, we spend our lives uh, running from it, pretending it won't happen, and get others to help us avoid it. But the reality is that death will face each one of us, sooner or later. And the statistics, they don't lie, do they? Sooner or later, we will all die. Death comes to us all. Our mortality ought to make us think about life and life after death. Our short lives here on earth, is this all we have? What about eternal life? Have you pondered questions like that in your life? Have you asked about eternal life? Well, the man in our reading from Mark 10 did, and he ran up to Jesus, fell at his feet in desperation, and shouted out, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What kept this man awake at night? Well, it was the questions of eternity, of life beyond death, and it's a great question for him to ask, and there's no one better to ask it to than the author of life. For Christians, we know that eternal life in the kingdom of God is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus, if you were with us last week, you've you've seen that he's been teaching about receiving the kingdom of God, to receive it like a little child, with dependence, with humility, with trust. But as we now see this rich man, he does not want to receive the kingdom of God, eternal life like that. And so our reading this morning, it's a rather sad story, and it's one that might make us feel uncomfortable. For like this man, well, we're all seeking eternal life. We're seeking something more. And like this man, we can make the same mistake of seeking it in the wrong things. And we see this in this conversation on faith and life with Jesus here in our first section, verses 17 to 22. Uh, under the title, We're All Seeking Eternal Life. Now, this man uh, who's seeking eternal life has got two problems. Uh, He's moral and he's wealthy. Now, you might not think that's much of a problem, is it? You'd love to uh, say you're a good citizen and that you've got a lot of wealth. Isn't it the purpose and goal in life, indeed, to live a good life and a prosperous life? Well, Jesus shows how these worldly ambitions will not lead to anything. They'll not lead to eternal life. And so he begins to tackling this first man's problem, do you see, in verse 18. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Well, this answer in verse 18 turns the conversation around from talking about morality, that is eternal life, to talking about mortality, Uh, sorry, from mortality, eternal life, to morality, about living life, good living. It's not right for this man to address Jesus in this way, as good teacher, until he's first ready to acknowledge that Jesus is good because he's from God. He is God. 
has this man really understood goodness and indeed the gospel? Indeed, have we as we listen in? How do we define goodness? How do we measure what's right and wrong? Well, we need something beyond ourselves. We need God to tell us. And he has. We have his commandments. We have his good law. Well, this man here was clearly religious. He knew the commandments by rote, and he kept all of them, he says, since he was a boy in verses 19 and 20. This lad had been to Sunday school. He would have scored pretty high on legal observance. Uh, And compared to others, well, this man was a good and upright citizen. But was Mr. Nice Guy really good enough? Well, we tend to judge our own goodness uh, on these commandments listed uh, here, or we compare ourselves, don't we, to others. We might say, well, I'm not that bad. I'm no saint, but I'm not a murderer. I'm not a rapist. I'm not a pedophile. I'm not like them. It's easy, isn't it, to see the wrong in others. I just go on to Twitter or Facebook, social media, and you see the boot being laid in or the, the tweet as we look at others. And often we do that, don't we, to justify our own goodness so we look better than them. But such self-righteousness is legalism, and it is not what we must do or have to have eternal life. No one is good, says Jesus. So stop trusting your own righteous record. Don't think because you're religious you're getting into heaven. What must I do then? Well, look at Jesus' words there in verse 19. Like every Sunday school pupil, this man knew that were, there were more commandments than that. How many are there but 10? So look again at verse 19. Which ones does Jesus leave out? Can you see? Well, it's those about loving God. It's the first few, isn't it? So when it comes to no other gods before me, when it comes to don't make an idol, this man doesn't come close. For his great wealth, well, that's become his God. That's what he's living for. Here's his real problem, his deeper problem. It's idolatry. Idolatry, it's anything we put before God in our lives, anything that we worship, that we devote ourselves to. And so he hasn't actually kept all of God's laws. He's not good enough. For his love for money shows that he's actually broken the first and second commandment. And this is revealed in what Jesus says to him in verse 21 and his response in verse 22. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Well, as you see, this man came seeking eternal life. But how badly does he want to find out? Well, the tragic answer is not enough, not badly enough. He's not prepared to leave his property and his possessions to follow Jesus. When the crunch came, this man's great wealth meant much more to him than eternal life. Well, the choice set by Jesus, it remains for us today. To follow him, to follow Jesus, does not mean that every disciple, every Christian, must sell all that we have and have nothing in the bank. But it does mean that our hearts must be fully focused on God. And it means every possession that we own is available for his use in his kingdom. Well, if we're truly seeking eternal life, then secondly, we must know that we're not able to earn it. We cannot earn eternal life. This takes us to our next section this morning, in which Jesus now turns his attention to the disciples. And as before, he teaches them the secrets of the kingdom. Verse 23, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, if this shocks you this morning, you're in good company because the disciples were amazed at his words. They saw, after all, wealth as a sign of God's blessing, that God was on your side. He'd given you these great things. 
How can it be hard then for the rich to enter God's eternal kingdom? Well, to help understand, Jesus illustrated it with a short parable in verse 25. It's about the impossibility of a camel, the largest animal uh, in the Middle East at the time, struggling to go through the eye of a needle. Think of a little needle, think of a huge camel. Jesus' point is not that it's a tight squeeze, but it cannot be done. It would be absurd to try. Why? It's impossible. Do you see the point then about the rich and the kingdom of God? Listen to how one author has helpfully put it. Paul Barnett said this, because wealth brings security against the unexpected, power over others, and the possibility of self-indulgent lifestyle, it is much sought after by those who believe that this world is all there is to human existence. It is therefore the most subtle and powerful of false gods, as Jesus well knew. How hard it is to put riches to one side so as to lay hold of Jesus and eternal life in the kingdom of God. Well, Jesus' teaching here leaves the disciples even more amazed, gobsmacked. If the rich are excluded, the disciples wonder, well, who then can be saved? Who then can be saved? It's another way of asking, how can someone enter the kingdom of God? How can someone have treasures in heaven? How can someone receive eternal life? Well, you see, Jesus, he drives his point home in verse 27. With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. So left to ourselves, it's mission impossible. We would never desire the kingdom of God more than riches. We'd, we'd be drawn just about the things around us, not the things of God. And so it's only by God's grace that we're given this desire to seek eternal life above everything else. The Bible tells us that there is a God who's made us and made this beautiful world. And God has put eternity into our hearts. Yes, we're made to enjoy this life, to live and work, enjoy our freedoms here, but we're meant for so much more than this world around us. God has made us inquisitive about eternity, about things after life. Yes, we're all seeking eternal life, as St. Augustine famously said of God, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. But here's the thing, we'll only find treasure in heaven when we come to admit that we're spiritually bankrupt before God. We're not able to earn eternal life. No one is good except God alone. And so we cannot earn our place in God's eternal kingdom and we must give up trying. It's impossible. Nor must we think that this world, well, that's all there is, and we'll just find our life here. As Jesus had previously said, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Well, tragically, this is just what the rich man did. He forfeited his soul, and it's the route that we can follow if we're not careful. We must realize that we need to be saved. And we must seek salvation in God's own Savior. Well, here's the good news of the gospel, the gospel of Mark, is that God has sent us a Savior. He sent us Jesus Christ. And only through Christ's perfect righteousness can any of us enter the kingdom of God. That's how God makes the impossible possible. God has sent us a Savior and it's for all who will receive him. Jesus came for the rich and the poor alike. He came for men and women. He came for adults and children. All of us can enter by faith alone in Christ Jesus alone. As he had said, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Do you see God's grace teaches us that we cannot earn it. We must receive it with childlike trust. Have you done that? Are you continuing to do that? As that old hymn has put it, the rock of ages, nothing in my hand I bring, 
simply to your cross I cling. Naked come to you for dress, helpless look to you for grace. Stained by sin to you I cry, wash me, Savior, or I die. Do you see what we must do to inherit eternal life? Well, we're to sacrifice all to receive eternal life. And this takes us to our final section this morning in verses 28 to 31. We're to sacrifice all to receive the eternal life. Now, perhaps the amazement of the disciples is followed by resentment in verse 28, as some might say. But I just wonder if the spokesman of the disciples, Peter, is starting to get it. Has he grasped what it means to, to follow the king? We have left everything to follow you. Well, Jesus didn't contra, uh, contradict Peter's words. Simon Peter and his brother Andrew were, were those who heard the call of the king uh, right by the shores of the Sea of Galilee, those fishermen. Jesus had said to them, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. But in complete contrast to the rich man, these fishermen were prepared to leave their nets and their families. And as they journeyed with Jesus, they learned that sacrifice lies at the heart of following Jesus, the King. As Jesus had said to would-be disciples back in chapter 8 of Mark's Gospel, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Well, Jesus now reassures disciples that although following him does mean giving up everything, well, God will provide. We see that at the end of our reading in these great words full of promise. Verse 29, truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fails for me and for the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, home, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fails, along with persecution and in the age to come, eternal life. Well, it's an amazing promise, isn't it? For all faithful followers, for millions of Christians throughout the world today and throughout the ages, we we can testify that these promises have come true. Following Christ, yes, it does mean we're to sacrifice all, but in sacrificing all, we have all to gain. Dying to self means living to Christ. New life does begin when we come to Jesus, when we repent and believe. In his words, we are born again. We receive new life when we respond to the call and follow him. And when we follow Jesus, will not be disappointed. It will be so worth it. We'll become part of a new extended family, the global family of God. And so this blessing begins in this life when we're received into the church family. We're welcome into homes where we receive new brothers, new sisters in Christ. Well, what a promise. What a promise that though believers have much to lose when they turn to Christ, well, God will supply all our needs. We might think of the Muslim convert disowned by their parents, kicked out of the home because they follow Christ, but they're surrounded by their new family of Christian brothers and sisters in the church. Persecutions for the sake of Christ, yes, they're also promised for us. And in the age to come, eternal life. And so the disciples of Christ well, they've got all to look forward to, but now they must count the cost. They must measure it up as they follow the king. Christians were to uh, sacrifice all for Christ's sake and for the gospel. We are those who are prepared to, to put others before ourselves, not self before side, but the side, Christ's side before ours. We need to do as Christ did. And we need to hear the challenge of Jesus' words both as individuals today and as the church. And so if we call ourselves Christians here today, we must be prepared to lose everything, life and riches for Jesus and the gospel. And we're also to be brothers and sisters or parents to those who've been disowned by their siblings on account of Jesus. 
There's an old English proverb, isn't there? Blood is thicker than water. Blood is thicker than water. We might say that. It means that the family bonds, well, they're always stronger than the bonds of friendship. Well, do you know for the Christian, there is a stronger bond than even that, than family blood. It's here. It's in God's family. It's the church. And so isn't it a privilege to be part of it, to belong by faith to God's new family? Well, Jesus still calls us to sacrifice all to receive eternal life. So let nothing get in the way of this. Make sure in our life that we neither let self-righteousness nor our wealth exclude us from the kingdom of God. Well, let's pray to that end now. Let's pray. God, our Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, the King. Thank you for what he has taught us this morning. Lord, on our search, on our seeking for eternal life, help us to come to you. May nothing hold us back, our own morality, our own idolatry. Help us to repent and believe the gospel. Help us to come knowing that it's impossible to earn our way. Help us to come to sacrifice before Jesus as we count the cost. And as we follow you, Jesus, we thank you for the family of God. Thank you for all who trust and know in Jesus. Please stir us up today as we would be generous, as we would sacrifice all for him and his sake. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. And let's all stand again as we continue to praise God using the words of the Magnificat or the Song of Mary from Luke chapter 1. So let us stand and we're doing this in a responsive form, so you say the words that are in bold. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my who has looked with favor on his lowly servant from this day will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. God has mercy on those who fear him from generation to generation. The Lord has shown strength with his arm and scattered the proud in their conceit casting down the mighty from their thrones and lifting up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich empty. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel to remember the promise of mercy, the promise made to our forebears, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. And let's just bow our heads as we have our closing prayer. Go now with confidence, for the Lord is with you. Reach out and live for him. Together we have celebrated the faith Now let us share it as we go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. And we join together in praying for each one of us as we say together the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.